RIP Commissioner Stern. Very sad to hear the news. You did great things for the game of basketball. Someone I always admired. Hashtag NBA family. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast, brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter, as always, at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today, we are looking at some of the games from New Year's Day. I won't be covering the Suns and Lakers game. I will write my recap for that up on BasketballMonster.com. Have a family thing to attend to uh, at the end of the day, so I won't be covering that one. But we'll be looking at the other three games, talking injury news, and then previewing the nine games for uh, coming up for Thursday as well in the NBA. Michael Bolton... Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it. Indeed. The first game of the new year, the Orlando Magic, they beat the Washington Wizards pretty comfortably, 122-101. Of course, the big story there is Jonathan Isaac going down really early with a knee injury. It looked bad. People were fearing the worst with an ACL injury. But the good news is the Magic tweeted out that it was a hyperextension. Woj tweeted out the same thing. Now, teams will always just tweet out you know, something basic. But when a reporter comes out, because teams know if it's an ACL straight away, you can do it from the medical test, if a physical touch test, they can tell. Um, and those reporters like Woj will then come out and say, fears are an ACL. He didn't say anything like that. The reports are even more positive after the game. Isaac's in the locker room walking around, bending his knee. There is still going to be an MRI, but they are saying there's still a chance that he doesn't even miss any time. So that's obviously great news. So you're not dropping him at any point, even if he was to miss time. There's no one who becomes an automatic ad or anything in those situations. And Mill Jefferson started the second half. You have Ken Birch getting more minutes. You get some extra uh, opportunities for Fultz, for Augustin and Ross. But I, I think that Fultz is already a back-end 12-team league guy. Augustin is trending in the right direction as well. He could be an option. But it doesn't appear that there's anything serious with Isaac. Hopefully, thankfully, we'll see what the MRI reveals, whether there's any meniscus or MCL injury uh, damage, but everything appears to be a positive at this point. Cautiously optimistic, cautiously positive with John Isaac and his knee injury. Let's talk the uh, about the rest of the game here. Augustin, as I mentioned, 25 points in 31 minutes, nine assists and two steals. He is really on a roll at the moment. And for that shooting ability, and the assists are obviously nice there too, he can have some value. I, I don't see it really lasting long-term, only if Isaac would be uh, out long-term, but this is a nice little run. While Fultz... He was putting up some good numbers. 16, 4, and 8 in 22 minutes for Fultz. Now, of course, it's against Washington, so great opportunities there. But he only played those 22 minutes. He got into some really early foul trouble, and he sat down early in the first half. Fuchs had 20 and 12, while Fournier had 18 and 4. Also got a block. That's always a great opportunity or a great instance when uh, Fournier can do that. Terry Ross had 15 points. Still just a stream type of guy. He doesn't offer really much else outside of points and threes. Awundu started in place of Aaron Gordon. Didn't do anything there. And then we had Birch with 20 six minutes. We had Jefferson with 13. He had 13 minutes from Melvin Frazier as well. There is no clear-cut winner if Isaac has to miss time and no absolute guarantee must-add guy. Augustin probably would be on the top of that list. For the Wizards, Brad Beal returned from his leg soreness, played only 30 minutes, and then did leave the game early to the locker room with the trainer. We haven't heard anything further, but I'm still absolutely shit scared about this leg. He had 27, 4, and 5. He took 20 shots. That's the numbers are sort of back to normal, but I am worried that we're going to see some minutes reduction, and Scott Brooks did say that after the game. He wants to play him 35. Cool. You should have been doing that for the last two years, but you haven't been, so let's see how that actually translates across. A sell-high opportunity, if you can get it for Beal, would be something I'd be looking to execute. Jordy McRae, even with Beal back, 31 minutes, 15 and 7 with two triples. 33% shooting, so those 60-65% nights we were seeing from the Wizards guys last time, uh, obviously they weren't realistic, and we've seen them drop off. Yeah, McRae can be a back-end 12-team league guy, while the uh, Bertans, Brian Hutchimura, Wagner, Quartet are out. Yes, they're all big men, but they take shots, and it pushes everyone else up positions when those guys are out, and that does benefit McRae. Troy Brown had 14-7 and seven in his 28 minutes. This is sort of just who he is. I think he's more of a 14-teamer than a 12. Well, Ish Smith outplayed Isaiah Thomas again. Thomas was bad. 
nine points in 19 minutes. I still think he's a 12-team league guy over Ish, who had 10, 5, and 3. But in a shallower, in an 8, in a 10, I think Thomas is looking like he's a bit of a drop at the moment. He is struggling. While Garrison Matthews, another 5 of 5 from the line, but he couldn't uh, maintain last game's production. Nor could Young Mihinmi, who had two points in 20 minutes, and Pesheshniks had four and 10 in his 24. The composer, John Williams, continues to start at power forward and really just barely play only 12 minutes for him with six boards during that time. I'm going to tell you about the great blokes over at my bookie. If you know the NBA, if you know your college basketball, my bookie is the place for you because they let you turn all of your sports knowledge into cash in your wallet. Football season, regular season is over. The playoffs are about to start. The NBA is kicking into high gear. College basketball's uh, right here. So there's no better time to get involved with my bookie. If you're a guy that likes to bet a little and try and win a lot, you should be trying a parlay. For instance, if you like a couple of the big favorites across this week, you can put them together into one bet multiplying the odds for a much bigger payout. So if you're going to bet this season, do the smart thing and go to mybookie.ag because no one gives you more ways to win. If you join right now, mybookie will match your deposit halfway all the way up to $1,000. That means if you deposit $2,000, you get an extra $1,000 in free money to play with. Just use the promo code LOCKEDONNBA to activate the offer. Once again, that promo code LOCKEDONNBA to activate mybookie's generous sign-up offer. Go to mybookie.ag today. You play, you win, and you get paid. Let's move on to the second game of the day. We have got the Portland Trailblazers. This is really, really bad from Portland. They got absolutely uh, smacked by the New York Knicks, one twenty, sorry, one seventeen to ninety three. Again, not a great day for the it's not Fizdale's fault crowd because he is a bad coach, and I am not absolving the front office or ownership of any blame because they're also terrible. Fizdale was equally terrible for Portland. Hassan Whiteside, seventeen and twelve. The world. Two steals and three blocks, and he's a little bit under on his percentages, but otherwise not too bad. Well, Mello, who was terrible last game, 26 and 7 looks great, but zero assists, zero steals, zero blocks, and it took 65% shooting to get here. If someone looks at this and goes, oh, that's all right, Mello's back, I would sell high on this one. The steals and blocks haven't come back. This is an unrealistic shooting type performance from Carmelo Anthony. I think there's a real chance he's not a top 100 guy as we move forward this season. But someone will believe it. And this is a great opportunity to try and do that. Lillard was bad. 11 points on 20 shots with 10 rebounds and 8 assists. While McCullum also struggled. 17 on 16 with 4 assists. And Kent Bazemore's struggle streak continued. 9 and 4 with a block in 29 minutes. Yes, he's starting. But it doesn't mean that you want anything to do with him in any sort of 12-team format. Anthony Simons was bad as well. 3 points on 8 shots. Gary Trent didn't do much. Let's be honest. This whole team, it was just a bad performance from Portland. For the Knicks... I think, uh, focused on this guy in the buy in the sell high video I did earlier today. Julius Randle, 22 and 13, three triples, high percentages again, a steal and a block. There's a lot happening here with him. He's like a uh, really high, like 80% plus from the line over the last couple of weeks when he's like a 65, 70% guy. So he's still in that real sell high window. I don't believe in this three point shooting or volume or the free throw shooting. And while he's a better player than what we saw with Fisdale, he's also not this level of player. So there is a definite window here with him. Nila Keenan was great, nine points, 10 assists and two blocks. That happens about one every 10 games. So nothing reliable there. While Alfred Payton, only the four points, eight assists and two blocks. Now, yeah, Peyton is a guy I've been touting as a guy that you, you go to add. I've ne- never been convinced of him with this team, and I didn't think it really fit any sort of forward direction in terms of yeah developing him. I could see his minutes disappearing at some point. I still would hold in 12 team as well. How about my bloke? And Mitch Robinson says, I'll take it from here. 22 points on perfect 11 of 11 shooting, a block, a steal, eight rebounds. Still, we want more minutes. He had one foul. He should never, under any circumstance, and if I'm going to criticize Fisdale for it, I'm going to criticize Mike Miller. Why is he playing only 27 minutes? Why have we, why is, What's this 10-minute nonsense of Taj Gibson starting a game? It is pointless. Robinson needs to be in there, and if he's not in foul trouble, play him 31. Play him 32 minutes. That was a really strong performance. Bob Portis was pretty good as well. 17 and 6 in true Portis style. No steals, no blocks, and one assist. That's what always limits him. While Marcus Morris was inefficient, but voluminous. 
Try again. Voluminous. That's a better pronunciation. 18 and 7 with two triples on 37% shooting. That's always the concern. Reggie Bullock, good to see him play his first game for the season after neck surgery. He had 11 points with three triples, taking some of Damian Dotson's playing time there as well. While Rowan Barrett Jr. was bad. 25 minutes, 7 points, 25% shooting. I think he's a drop. He was on my Players to Drop podcast the other day. Um, nothing that in those couple of days have really made me change my mind. I think he can go in most category formats. Points leagues, it's a little bit different, but he is absolutely trending in the wrong direction at the moment, Big Rowan Barrett. Let's go on to the next game now. We're looking at the Minnesota Timberwolves, or whatever is left of the Minnesota Timberwolves. They lost to the Milwaukee Bucks, 106-104. Really, really courageous from the Wolves. Who her, Who would? I can't even speak who were without Andrew Wiggins, Carl Anthony Towns, Trevion Graham, Noah Vonley, and Jeff Teague and jo- Jake Lehman. My name is Jeff. Shabazz Napier, 31 minutes, 22, 6, and 3. While these guys are out, Napier's got value. We don't know if he will continue to start after that, but there's enough there with him. While Jarrett Culver, 33 minutes, big numbers, 8 rebounds, 5 assists, 1 steal, 1 block, but the percentages are still rough. He, was, uh, he didn't look that great at the end of the game. I'm not convinced he's going to be a 12-team league guy this season. Covington had 7-11 and 11 with three steals and a block. That's a very Covington sort of line, getting those defensive numbers. Well, Gorgie Jing, foul trouble, kept his playing time down, but still had 15-6. and six. And despite shooting just 29%, he has been really, really strong. And as long as Towns is out, which I reckon we might get a couple more games of that, Jeng is a guy to roster. Akogi played better after being trashed last game, 12-4 and four with two steals, while Keelan Martin was bad, three points on seven shots. He's had a couple of games in a row of not being good, and maybe that's because he's not that good. Jalen Noel also got into the rotation in this game with all those guys out. He had 12 points, and Naz Reed had 11 with Noah Vonley sidelined. Uh, he played 18 minutes, but really not a lot to see in terms of utilization for fantasy. For Milwaukee, Yanni had 32 and 17 with two blocks. Horrible from the line, pretty standard there. While Brook Lopez was great. 11 and 4, 31 minutes, six blocks. If he's in your on your waiver wire, he shouldn't be. Make sure he is rostered. Chrissy Middleton, 13 and 8, a poor shooting night from Middleton. Took 18 shots to get there. He'd been much better than that earlier this season. While Dante DiVincenzo, the big ragu, started once again in place of Wes Matthews. Um, six and eight. His performance as that starting shooting guard versus when he was the starting point guard seems markedly different. I think, despite the fact that he's still starting, he is a drop now in 12-teamers. Ilya Sova's strong run uh, didn't continue 7-5 and five in 17, while Paddy Connaughton played an inexplicable 26 minutes, 7-6 and six for Connaughton during that time frame. That is all of the games from that I'm going to be covering here from New Year's Day, from Wednesday. Again, that last game, the Lakers and the Suns. I'll recap that over on Basketball Monster a little later in the day. So let's look at some injury news before we get into the DFS action. All right, so not much in terms of injury news coming out here, apart from that John Isaac knee injury, which is obviously a big concern. And then, yeah, our, some of our fears have been alleviated. We'll update that more over on the site and on Twitter when we get that information come through. Ryan Brokoff has suffered a leg fracture. He was sort of sneaking into the rotation, but uh, it looks like it's going to be a multi-week absence here for Brokoff, probably three to four weeks, which is never great. And the last thing I want to talk about, it's not really an injury, but people have asked me about it, is Darren Collison looking to return potentially Potentially to the NBA after you know, re- abruptly retiring at the beginning of the season to spend more time on his faith and his family. Apparently, all he needed to do there was do that for seven months. He's looking to return um, in February, apparently. This is also a bloke, remember, that was convicted of domestic assault. So, yeah, don't, uh, don't be too happy about him. But this is a guy that you know, last season... Played 28 minutes a night, was the 79th ranked player, 59th the year before that, 97th the year before that. Like, he's not a high upside guy. But in those situations in Sacramento and Indiana, he can you know, do things. 11, 12 points, 5, 6 assists, shoots really high percentages, great from the line on low volume, uh, great three-point percentage as well. But if he goes to the Lakers, like, is it just going to be like he fits in there with KCP and Avery Bradley? Because he's not handling the ball. LeBron's doing that. Like We know that. If he goes to the Clippers, what's he going to do? Take Lou Williams, Patrick Beverly, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard's minutes? I don't think that he's any going to be any sort of 12-team league guy. Maybe he can hover around the top 150. He's solid enough. He provides good minutes. He'd be better than Rajon Rondo for the Lakers, no doubt. But he, this is a guy that needs a yeah, pretty decent chunk of minutes. Uh, yeah, needs that thir- 28 to 30 a night to be that top 100 type of player. And if he's getting 22 to 23, which I think would most likely be the case in both of those team scenarios where he was mentioned, 
uh, then that's probably not going to be all that interesting from a fantasy point of view. But that is also still, uh, February is still a month or so away. So we'll see exactly what does go on with Daz when we head into that portion of the season. Let's now look at DFS. We're looking at the games for Thursday. A very busy Thursday, nine games in the NBA. We're going to be looking at fan jewel pricing for today. The first one we look at, Charlotte at Cleveland. The Cavs are actually two-point favorites here. The total is a very, very low 210 points. Um, interesting that the Cleveland is favorite. They've been playing pretty well of late, but... Um, I'm not really sure why they are. I think I'd take the Hornets plus the two in this one. Let's look at the point guards. The Padawan, Colin Sexton, 5,100. Um, I like the value in that. I think there's good cash floor there. He's averaging 28 over the last five. Nothing about the Hornets makes me think they're going to be able to do anything defensively to stop him. But I like that. Uh, Terry Rogers at 62, more of a GPP guy. Same with Garland at 42. Actually, I'm not even interested in Garland for GPPs. To be honest, and then onto the shooting guards, you've got uh, Devonte Graham at 7,700, who continues to just shoot horribly. It's been really, really bad, but the numbers have been fine. 37 average over the last five. Now, if the shots go in, then he smashes the $7,700 value mark. It's a great opportunity against this Cavs backcourt, but is it just the fact that maybe he's not a good shooter and that he's going to jack up the shots and it's nothing to do with defense? I think that's a real concern. Maybe I'd look at uh, Graham, and I don't mind if for cash because he is still putting up numbers despite the shots refusing to go in for what seems like all of December. There is still some value there. Malik Monk and Cody Martin, no thanks. That's small forward. Kevin Porter's at 41. I like his ability to get 20. That makes him a safe floor guy, and then I think he can push up if the shot starts to go in. He's been under 40% shooting each of the last two games. So there's a, an element of improvement there. While Miles Bridges had been trash, but then last game he had 36 points, which at $5,000 is really, really good. Would I feel great about using him? No, but in a uh, upside tournament, and he only had like 14, 5, and 4 or something in that game. It wasn't a huge line, but it still smashed his value. And he obviously has the opportunity to, uh, to do that if he's playing well. At power forward, the Muppet John Henson's at 3,500. That's going to be a no from me. Paul Washington Jr.'s at 53. That's a yes from me. That's a strong floor with tournament upside, while Love's at 7,200. Uh, I think that might be a little bit too high for Kevin there. Larry Nance, no thank you with everyone healthy. At center, Tristan Thompson's at 6,400. I don't really like that. I think the upside's low. I think the floor's pretty low also. Although the only positive I'll give you here is that going up against Charlotte is a real boon for opposing center. So maybe he has a 35-pointer. I'm not really convinced of it here with Tomo, but there is some... I guess this is one of the matchups where you could have appeal in it. Biombo and Zella... That is a good matchup for them as well, going up against the Cavs in their front court, but they are too sort of up and down to really get a full read on where that's going to go. Next up, it is the Denver Nuggets and the Indiana Pacers. The Pacers coming off a big win against the Sixers. Malcolm Brogdon is doubtful after missing uh, or coming back and then you know, hurting his back. He was back spasm, so we're going to get Aaron Holiday starting once again. Azar is at 5,100. And then for Denver, sorry, I should have mentioned this, Gary Harris is questionable with that shin issue. Aaron Holiday at 5,100, I really, really like in a starting role. While the Blue Arrow, Jamal Murray at 65. It is a marginally positively tilted matchup for him. I think we look more at him as a tournament guy than any sort of cash value. Monty Morris played well last time out, but that's a little bit of a fluke. At shooting guard, Jeremy Lamb's at 5,000. Despite not playing that well, he still gives you $5,000 worth of value most nights. And with Brogdon out, I feel like he does it again. A good cash play there. Gaz Harris, no thank you. Uh, for your small forwards, TJ Warren's at 5,100. Much like uh, Colin Sexton that I mentioned earlier, at a similar price. Like He just gets 27, 28 nearly every night, and that's really strong cash value there for Warren. Justin Holiday, no. Doug McDirt, no. Farton Will Barton's at 6,400, and he's putting up 30, 34, 35 a night, which is really strong. And I think if Harris is out, that does give him value, even more value. At power forward, DeMontis Sabonis at 8,000. Maybe a little bit too high. His numbers have been down, averaging just 30, uh, sorry, 41 over the last five. He, he can be better than that. It's not a bad option, but I think we still can do a do better job there. Paul Millsap at 48 exceeded that last time. I don't have confidence in that. While well, Jeremy Grant and Michael Porter Jr. Maybe Michael Porter at 41, if we hear Gazza is out, we might get another start from Porter. Otherwise, he'd be a, not a guy that I'd look at. Big Chungus Nikola Jokic is at 9,200. He averages 52 against the Pacers. No reason to think he can't be at least a 45-point guy, so that's a, a decent floor, and then he's got some upside. Miles Turner at 58. I don't think we should get any sort of level of excited about him at all. Next up is the Toronto Raptors. It's the Miami Heat. 
In Miami, the Heat are six-point favorites, and the total is 215 points here. Kendrick Nunn's at 4,400. Justice Winslow's out, so his minutes should push up, but he's been really struggling lately, Nunn, but I like that salary for him, despite the fact that he's averaging just 22 over the last five. I think he can beat it as a tournament sort of a guy. The iron shoulder, Goran Dragic is at 5,000. I like him more for cash, and then Lowry's at 7,800. We know he's going to get the minutes to put up those numbers, so that gives him really, really good value in my opinion. At shooting guard, Jim Butler's at 8,700, probably a little bit on the high side, while Tyler Hero's at 4,000, and I have a zero trust in that, while Fred Van Vliet at 82. I also think that is probably a little bit too high. Dunkey Robinson's at 41. Terrence Davis, no interest in those guys. For your small forwards, Derek Jones Jr. is at 4,500. He just doesn't get it uh, going for me. While the Jedi, Oji Ananobi. Hello there. He is at 4,900. He had 28 points last game. It took a, a little bit for that to come together. He came off the bench in that game. I would not feel all that excited about using Ananobi, and I wouldn't be surprised to see like a 22, 23 point performance. But 4,900 is not a bad price, so it's not a complete write off for OG. I just think we can do better. At power forward, Serge Ibaka's at 71. He's getting a 35 a night most nights. That's pretty good at 7,100. I'll take it. And then you go on to Bam Bam at a buyer who has slowed down, averaging under 40 in his last five. And at 8,800, you can't afford that level of slowdown. So he's probably someone we leave out. Hollis Jefferson started in place of Ananobi last game, but he doesn't really move the needle, nor does the water boy Chris Boucher. And that center, Myers, Leonard, and Kelly Linick, they can comfortably be left alone. Let's go next game. It is the Utah Jazz and the Chicago Bulls. The Jazz are three and a half point favorites at home, and the total is 210.5 points. Of course, the Bulls have listed everybody on the injury report. Sataransky, Archer, Giacono, Felizio, Levine, and Wendell Carter are all probable, while Chandler Hutchison is questionable. Mike Conley is out. Chris Dunn at point guard. He is at 5,100. He was a disaster last game. I think we can do better than him. Sataransky at 57. Also not too good last time out for Chicago. But he'd been pretty strong before that, averaging uh, 32 over the last five, which at 5,700 really does work in your favor. I reckon this matchup might make you steer a little bit clear of him, though. Kobe White has played a couple of good games in a row. He's at 4,500. That's a $600 price rise. This might be the one to leave him out, I think. At shooting guard, Jordy Clarkson's at 46. I think he can get to that number against his Bulls team. Um... Especially with Conley out, he's getting a couple extra shots, a couple of extra minutes in that bench roll. He can get there. I'm not sure his upside's very high, but he can get to that number. While Don Mitchell's at 77. He's Don. He's good. Uh, I really like that price for Mitch as well. As for Zach Levine at 79, I would take Mitchell over him and save the $200. But Levine's not a bad option. I still would take Don, though. At small forward, Boyan Bogdanovich has come down to 5,600. I love that price. I think there's a really good floor, and he could be a 45-point guy really comfortably. So I think there's good value in him at that sort of a salary. Jinglin Joe's at 5,500. Uh, similarly to Boyan, uh, I think there's good floor value in Ingles with some upside. So both of those options at that price do work. While at Power Forward, Royce O'Neill, no thank you. Lowry Markinen still returning from his illness. If we hear there's no issue with the illness, 57 is a good price. He had 27 last game in just 27 minutes. So if he got 30 minutes, yeah, we could expect a 30-plus point performance from Markinen. We just don't know with the illness at this point. Thad Young's a fade. And then at center, Gobert is at 8,800. I reckon that might be pushing it just a little bit, but he is averaging 44 over his last five. I don't really like it outside of the fact that the Bulls are, outside, outside of Charlotte, the Bulls are one of the best teams for opposing centers to go up against, and Gobert gets that opportunity. He's averaging 46 the last three times against Chicago, of course, in previous seasons. Uh, Wendell Carter at 53. The, the Gobert matchup is probably one that I'd want to avoid here for Wendell. Next game we look at, we've got the Golden State Warriors, the Minnesota Timberwolves. No spread or total out for this one. We don't know what's happening with Minnesota. Will Andrew Wiggins, will Jeff Teague, will Carl Anthony Towns, will Trevion Graham, will Noah Vonley play? So much up in the air about those guys. I would have to assume that Towns is out of this one. That's my assumption. That's not fact. And that gives more value to Gorgie Jang. I would expect that Jeff Teague is out of this one as well. Wiggins, I think, is a chance to return, but I don't think we'll be seeing Teague and Towns. Total guess, though. Uh, 5,000 is is Teague. Um, yeah, again, I just don't expect him to be playing in this one. For the Warriors, also mentioned this, uh, D'Angelo Russell is out. Willie Cauley-Stein is out again as well after missing that game against San Antonio. 
So uh, the lubricant Kai Bowman's at 3,900. He had 20 points, but the minutes didn't really go up despite Russell being out. So uh, he's a real tentative tournament guy. Not interested there. Napier at 5,000 would be really strong, Shabazz, if Teague is out, which I assume is going to happen. So I think I do like Shabazz there. And then we go to shooting guards. Wiggins at 7,000. If he plays, I like that a lot. Well, Damian Lee is at 6,000. He has got tremendous value there, given the absence of D'Angelo Russell. Trivion Graham, no thank you. Jacob Evans also. At small forward, I love Alec Burks, 5,600. Really, really strong position for him here. The little dog, Glenn Robinson's at 47. Uh, he is quite up and down, so he's not a guaranteed cash sort of a guy. Well, Jarrett Culver at 43. I think there's a real opportunity for him again to beat that value number. At power forward, Marquise Chris at 43. Should start again at center in place of Corley Stein. He had 31 last game. He should beat that number pretty comfortably, while Bob Covington's at 5,200 also. Really like his spot here with those absences or presumed absences. And Draymond down at 6,700. He should be a 30-point minimum guy. The matchup's okay for him. I like this one. I don't like it for Eric Pascal. At center, Towns is at 10,000. If he played, it'd be great. I just don't see that happening here. Well, Jeng's at 6,400. And if he, again, if Towns is out, Jeng at that price does look like a pretty strong option. Let us go on to the next game. It's the Brooklyn Nets. It's the Dallas Mavericks. Kristaps Porzingis. Porzingis. He is questionable with knee soreness. Of course, Kyrie is out. Karis LeVert is out. Kevin Durant is out. Don't need to mention that one. But Garrett Temple has also popped up on the injury report as questionable with a sore knee. If he is out, I'd expect them to start Timotei Lawawu Cabarro, give more minutes to Theo Pinson, to Jana Musa, and Rowdy Rodion's Kurooks as well. At point guard, Doncic is at 10-8. Oh, Tim Hardaway also out. Sorry for Dallas. Doncic is at 10-8. He had 59 in his first game back. No reason to think he doesn't get a 55-pluser again. He looks like a really good spot here. While the burner, Jalen Brunson, started in place of Hardaway, did nothing. But there is at least some tournament value if we hear he starts. Dinwiddie's at 8,400. He got uh, got 53 last game. He'd been a little bit off before that game, but I like him at that salary still. While Seth Curry at 38 makes a nice tournament guy. Shooting guard, Garrett Temple, no thank you. And then we go down to DeLon Wright, who prior to the last game had been playing well. It was a little bit smoke and mirrors from from Wright, it did feel like. So I'm not willing to spend 49 on him. While Lawawu Cabro at minimum salary, there's where your value might be. That could be a really interesting uh, option there for Timotei. Um, and then we go on to your power forwards. Jarrett Allen, noted power forward. He's at 5,600, has been struggling, but a great matchup. Going up against Dallas, centers have put up some good numbers. This could be a tournament type of a spot here for Jarrett, while Porzingis at 84 with Doncic playing, that's a fade. And of course, if Porzingis is out, Maxi Kleber at 42 comes in as a really, really solid option. And then at center, Dwight Powell at 5,100. If Powell's actually beaten that number consistently, 30-point average over the last five. Rolling into his own, really strong cash value in a positive matchup. Well, similarly, DeAndre Jordan also putting up 28 a game over the last five at 58, uh, 5,100. Good value for both Powell and Jordan with limited upsides, but relatively safe floors. I would rather take Powell over DeAndre Jordan personally. Next game up, the Oklahoma City Thunder and the San Antonio Spurs. The Spurs are two-point favorites, and the total is 218.5 points at point guard. DeJounte Murray is at 5,700. He dropped 36 in the overtime win from the Spurs last time out against the Warriors. I think that he can at least get close to that 30 mark, which gives him really good value here. Chris Paul's at 7,400. Didn't score for about the first 20 minutes of the last game and still gave us 36 fan jewel points. At 7,400, it is still a good spot. Derek White, no thank you. Uh, shooting guard Schroeder is at 6,200. He just racks up 30 a night, and that's really, really valuable for cash cash games. Well, Gilgis Alexander is also on a heater. His lowest score, Shea, in his last five has been 34. That is a great, great floor. No reason to think it's necessarily going to stop here. Same with DeRozan at 77, who's on a hot streak at the moment, 41 average over the last five. Can he keep doing it? I think he can, uh, at least for one more game. But this Thunder defense is one that would at least make you second-guess that or think, oh, maybe this is the one where it stops. The drip Lonnie Walker just won't be enough minutes there for him, while Terry Ferguson, uh, he's averaging four points over the last three games in 27 minutes. Sure. The Italian cock. Hands off my cock! Danilo Gallinari, 6000 bucks. Love the floor value. Love the cash value. Hasn't really been a big tournament blow-up guy, but I do like that for the Rooster. Rudy Gay stunk it up last game, and there's no other small forwards worth mentioning. At power forward, Aldridge is at 83. He is on a real heater, knocking down threes, banging in everything. He looks like a 40-point type of guy, so I like it. And he does well against the Thunder, averaging 47 against Oklahoma City the last three times. And then on to the centers. Pirtle's at 38. Just not enough minutes to get excited, but... 
He is averaging 20 points over the last five and only 17 minutes, which at 3,800, it's not a horrendous amount. You can do better. Uh, Steve Adams is at 6,200. I don't really see much upside in that. And I somehow missed Nerland's Noel, who's up at 5,200. That's because he's listed as a power forward. Why wouldn't he be? He's averaging 32 over the last three. I think that price might be a little bit too high, though, 5,200. It really does rely upon him getting steals and blocks. And going from three steals to one steal is going to just make him useless in terms of that salary. So it is a little bit tough to get too excited about him there. The next game up, Memphis and Sacramento. The Kings are favored by four, and the total is 222.5 points. Marvin Bagley is out. Jay Crowder is questionable for Memphis. So Nemanja Bielitsa will likely get another start at point guard. De'Aaron Foxy Fox, 7,200. His last three games against Memphis have yielded 38 points per contest. Uh, A little bit disappointing the last couple here from Fox. I think this matchup's a a decent one for him, so I am on board with him there. Well, Ja Morant has really been struggling, and if you're going to use him, it has to just be for tournaments. DeAnthony Melton at 43 got some extra minutes last game with Crowder out. So if Crowder is out, maybe there's some appeal, but I I don't think he's the greatest DFS guy here. Tyus Jones and Corey Joseph, no. At shooting guard, Bud Heald, 6,200, averaging 36 over the last three games. That's enough. The matchup's a good one. I'm here for Bud at that sort of a price. While Bogdan Bogdanovich is probably a fade, and Dylan Brooksy Brooks is not someone that you should be interested in. The pencil, Harrison Barnes. Barnesy. Uh, he's at 4,400 because he's averaging 20 points over the last five. So unless that gets you excited, I think you'd probably leave him alone. Crowder, the same. And then on to power forwards. Beer Leeds is at 4,900. Wasn't his best game last time out, but I still think at that price, that's really, really good value for Beer Leeds going up against this Memphis team. While Rishon Holmesy Holmes at 6,700 seems really low. Centers do well against this Grizzlies team. Holmes does well against every team. He's averaging 38 over the last five. Absolutely love this one. While Triple J, Jaron Jackson Jr., 68. 100, probably more tournaments. Um, again, it's 100 bucks more the way you are with Holmes, and I feel a little bit better with Rashawn at that salary. Brandon Clarky Clark's at 5,100. He can get 30 a night. There is an element of risk in there with him, but he has been pulling up some good numbers. I reckon I might lean a different direction. That direction probably wouldn't be Jonas Valanciunas at 6,600. Centers have really struggled against the Kings because Rashawn Holmes is there. And then, of course, the undertaker, Dwayne Dedman, he's not going to be involved in this game in all likelihood. The last game of the day, it is the Blake Griffin Bowl. Detroit heading back to the Clippers. Of course, Blake Griffin's not playing in this game because of his sore knee, which is, again, really worrisome. Markeith Morris also out. Will they start the crucifix Christian Wood? I don't know. Maybe they go with that Tony Snell lineup again, but it shouldn't matter. Wood will get the bulk of those minutes and play close to 30. Lou Williams is not on the injury report after having a child, well, after being there while his partner had a child for the last game for the Clippers, while Pat Beverly is out again. At point guard, Derek Rose is at 6,000. He just gets that number. The upside's limited because of the minutes limit, but 6,000, no worries. The matchup is the only negative factor there on Rose against the Clippers, but Beverly's out, so that suits him. Timmy Frazier might get another start, but I would uh, implore you to not to care about that. Well, we might see some more Derek Walton and Landry Shamit, but they're not really going to do too much DFS damage especially with Lou Williams back, and he comes in at 5,200, which looks ridiculously cheap. I think we have to look at Lou at that sort of a salary. The Shark, Bruce Brown at 46, also has some value, but probably more as a tournament guy. Svima K look would likely start, but not caring about that at all. Paul George is at 8,000 bucks. The Beatle is averaging 43 over the last three. Despite not shooting all that well recently, I think there is good value in him there. And then you go to Mo Harkless, who's going to be a strong no. And then at Power Forward, it is the Crucifix. Christian Woods at 4,100. Only 21 points last game, but it's the 28 minutes that gets me excited. I think he can really have like a 30-pointer here. Cash, tournaments, value is there, while the fun guy, Kawhi Leonard's at 9,500. I'm a fun guy. (laughs) He's at 9,500, as I mentioned. He should be a 45-ish sort of a guy. I like him, but I probably prefer Paul George in this situation. At center, the table, Montrez Harrell has been not good. 26 average over the last five, but consequently, his salary is down at 52. So this is a matchup where he can actually get... Get those numbers up. Drummond at 9,800 without Blake. He's a high 40s guy. So I think there is real value in him as a cash upside so or cash floor sort of a guy. If it's a Zubats at 44, it just requires Harold's minutes to be limited for him to step it up. And he's been stepping it up. I just don't know that Harold's minutes are necessarily going to be limited. If we just flick it over now and look at some DraftKings guys, Wood and Williams come in there. Uh, Brunson, Kevin Porter, Kawhi. Uh, I think Sabonis looks all right. Bielitsa, Jim Butler, Doncic, uh, although he's pretty highly priced. I don't mind Luca over there. Paul George, Andre Drummond. 
Um, Danilo Gallinari, Bud Heald, Kendrick Nunn is a little bit of upside option over on DraftKings also. Guys, that will do it for me today. Subscribe to this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube. Give me a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below. All of those great things. I hope your new year is off to a sparkling start, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Horford.